Welcome back, my dear followers. This is yet another episode of the history of the American Mafia. The true story of the American Mafia, brought to you to podcast by Fabio Fabiano and translated in English and read by me, Grace Cardlisi. This is part two of the Castellama is a War. If you haven't yet listened to part one, look it up on Spotify and iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's get back to our story. After the death of Mineo, Lucky Luciano had become one of Masseria's most important associates. But soon enough, the first misunderstandings began between the two. Masseria trusted no one but Sicilians to make criminal deals with. Luciano, on the other hand, didn't have these limits. Among his best allies were two Jews, the two criminals, Mayer Lansky and Bulgsky Siegel. Luciano could not stand Masseria's refusal to his innovative ideas to expand the business into new criminal activities such as prostitution, gambling and trade unions. The Castellamarese war had caused deaths on both sides. There were high-speed chases and shootings on the streets of New York. And this was very bad for the lucrative business of alcohol smuggling. The gangsters had lost millions of dollars. As a result of this feud, Lucky Luciano began to fear that the forces of law and order, pressed by the public to carry out more in-depth investigations, could reveal the lucrative l- rackets that the gangsters rang. Luciano was in a typical mafioso compared to the old Sicilian bosses, He was part of the new generation of mafiosi who opposed the old Sicilian bosses whom he called, in a derogatory way, mustaches or Mexicans. His background was different. He had reached the United States of America as a child, so he spoke English better than Italian. He was more interested in business than in vendettas and murderous acts. Indeed, he considered these to be a disadvantage and a deterrent to the alcohol smuggling business he had set up. At this point, Maranzano placed yet another winning move. The man from Castellamarese spread the news that he would not take revenge on Masseria's men once Joe Masseria, the boss, was eliminated. Basically, he had hinted it would have been better for one of his rival's men to have resolved the matter by killing his boss and thus the war would end, for all, in a profitable way. Indeed, they took the bait. Lucky Luciano secretly met Maranzano in an apartment controlled by the Castellamarese boss. The the two saw eye to eye, and Lucky Luciano promised that he would resolve the issue by Easter 1931. In exchange, Maranzano would appoint him boss of the family led by Masseria and his deputy. At this point of the story, we meet another gangster who will take part actively in the events. And I will tell you all about his story in a following podcast. But for the time being, let me introduce him to you. His name is Joe Adonis, Giuseppe Antonio Dotto's pseudonymum born in Monte Marano in Avellino in the Campania region in the south of Italy on November the 22nd, 1902. When Masseria heard about Lucky Luciano's betrayal, he asked Adonis, who had recently joined his clan, to kill him. Adonis, however, warned Luciano about the plot organized by Masseria to kill him. On April the 15th, 1931, Luciano put in act a classical trap for a mafia murder. He invited his boss to lunch at one of Joe's favourite restaurants with the pretext of discussing a plan to kill Maranzano. The restaurant chosen was the Nuova Villa Tamaro, specialised in typical Italian cuisine, located in Coney Island, a well-known holiday resort in Brooklyn. Legend has it, But after a lavish lunch, the two mafiosi sat down to play cards. At a certain point, Luciano excused himself to go to the bathroom and left the room. 
The story as told amongst gangsters in the mob world throughout the years is that presumably Albert Anastasia Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel entered the restaurant and shot Joe the boss. Ciro Terranova, or so-called the King of Artichokes, was waiting outside in the driver's seat of the car to be used by the killers for their escape. It was said he was so shocked he wasn't able to start the car once they were all on board. At that point, the gangster Siegel pushed him out of the driver's seat and got behind the wheel of the car. Luciano was stopped by the police for questioning, but he declared that he had not seen the perpetrators of the murder. Police were led to suspect a gangster from Calabria, a certain John Silk Stockings Giustra, and thought that he had killed Masseria and had done so on behalf of Maranzano. These suspicions were based on tips from an informant who had indicated one of the coats found at the crime scene as belonging to Giustra. After all, the police could hardly have imagined that one of Joe the boss's closest associates could have betrayed his own boss. From the police's reconstruction, it was assumed that Masseria was sitting at a table playing cards with two or three strangers when he was shot in the back. He died of gunshot wounds to the head, back and chest. Masseria's autopsy report certifies that he died on an empty stomach. No witnesses were found. He is certain that two or three men were seen hastily leaving the restaurant and getting into a stolen car. No one was ever convicted for Masseria's murder. No witnesses or evidence was ever found. And Luciano had a solid alibi. The case was dismissed after the murder of Justa, the only suspect, which took place on July the 9th, 1931. No one showed up at Joe the Boss's funeral, not even his wife. A macabre photo published in the New York newspaper became famous. In the image, you can see Masseria's corpse on the restaurant's blood-strewn floor, with an ace of spades between his fingers. It was said it was the work of a photojournalist who, to give sensationalism to the shot, slipped the card between the victim's fingers.